Welcome to this session about timing and indication for PCI in TAVI patients with coronary artery disease. My name is Nicolas Dumonte, interventional cardiologist in Toulouse, and I'm happy to discuss about this topic uh, with Simon Redwood from St. Thomas, London, and Marco Barbanti from Catania. So, Simon, the, the first thing I, I would like to, to cover and we would like to discuss is what do we do when we find some significant coronary artery disease in a patient that is about to, to undergo a TAVI? And uh, I would be interested to, to know about your decision-making process in that situation. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. And it's an important point because if somebody has coronary disease and aortic stenosis and is undergoing surgical AVR, they will almost inevitably have their coronaries revascularized. But that doesn't seem to be the case with TAVI. And it seems that it's done on an ad hoc basis. I think we're probably all agreed that if a patient has significant angina, then uh, they probably should have revascularization as well. But in my mind, the real question is what we do with patients without angina. And for that reason, we performed the activation trial, which is actually the only randomized trial addressing this situation. So we took 235 patients that had significant coronary disease associ uh, and associated aortic stenosis and were undergoing TABI. And importantly, we took patients that had CCS class zero to two, and they were randomized to pre-TABI PCI versus no pre-TABI PCI. The mean age of the patients was just under 84, and you'll see uh, the logistic Euro score um, is 15.1, with an STS of 6.8. And what we found on the right-hand side is that if we look at the one-year cumulative risk of death or rehospitalization, there was actually no difference between the two groups. This was a non-inferiority trial. And although there was no difference in the numbers, it did not quite reach the non-inferiority margin. And we got a p-value of 0 0.067. However, if you look at the as-treated population, it was significant. So I think there's fairly good evidence now that pre heavy PCI is not necessary. Uh, and importantly, we also showed higher bleeding uh, in the um, pre tavi PCI group, although there was a slightly higher number of patients on uh, anticoagulation in the, the TAVI group. So what I take home from this is if the patient has significant angina, they probably should have uh, pre tavi PCI. If they don't have significant angina, then we should just treat the aortic stenosis and then address the coronaries post TAVI if necessary. Thank you very much, Simon. Very helpful. Uh, uh, just maybe one uh, precision that, that could be useful also for uh, us uh, in our everyday practice. Um, from the conclusions we, we can have from the activation trial, um, the, the, the patients who had left main or severe osteo uh, uh, coronary artery disease were also included. So can we uh, extend the conclusion activation to those patients or not? Yeah, that's a very important point. The, the simple answer is no, they were not included. So if it was felt that the patient had prognostically significant coronary artery disease, they were not included in the trial. So left main or left main equivalent did not go into this trial. So I think in those patients, <clears throat> even in the absence of angina, we should seriously consider performing pre tally PCI. Thank you very much, very clear. So we've heard about what we should do pre-TAVI, but how about uh, the clinical evidence on post-TAVI PCI? And I'd like to ask Marco Barbanti what his views are on that. Marco. Yeah, Simon, this is a very important question. And actually, before talking about what about the PCI after TAVI, we should talk about um, the clinical presentation of uh, coronary artery disease uh, after TAVI. Uh, we might say that in the last few years, uh, we had um, a significant number of papers on this topic. And this is one of the most uh, important ones published by Mantias uh, in Jack Intervention back in 2020. And um, on more than 100,000 patients uh, with TAVI, um, we had more than 6,000 uh, um, who were admitted with, a, with a, a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome. And 48% uh, uh, percent of, uh, um, uh, patient, of admission occurring within the six months. And what this paper says, uh, which is very important, that it's very important the, pre the presentation, the clinical presentation of coronary artery disease. And we see here from these uh, Kaplan-Meier curves that um, STEMI and uh, non-STEMI were associated with a significant poor prognosis as compared with unstable angina. 
Another paper, uh, which is very important, uh, is not just uh, uh, shows that not just the clinical presentation, but also whether or not these patients uh, uh, with acute coronary syndrome of the TAVI um, uh, um, were treated or not. So it's very important to see that uh, patients uh, who underwent uh, a revascularization had a better prognosis uh, uh, compared with patients who had no revascularization. And this study from Farouk's uh, uh, in which the management um, was uh, uh, invasive uh, in uh, 163 patients and PCI was performed in 97 patients. One of the most important outcomes were that coronary access issues were assessed in only 2.5% of patients uh, of uh, coronary angiography and 2.1% of PCI. Uh, but more importantly, revascularization of acute coronary syndrome uh, time associated with, uh, was associated with a reduction of the risk of all-cause death. This is the most recent paper in press in JAK, focusing all in STEMI patients. And uh, it's very important to see that the, uh, the, the incidence of STEMI was not very high, only 0.3%. But um, when comparing uh, STEMI patients uh, uh, in those who received a TAVI as compared with those who, not, uh, who didn't have a TAVI, um, the dog to balloon time was significantly less um, in patients with no uh, TAVI. Uh, the PCI failure was fourfold higher in patients who underwent TAVI as compared with uh, no TAVI. And the prognosis of these patients was absolutely poor with a 33% of mortality at one year. But regarding the, the feasibility of access after transcarpic valve implantation, uh, this is a, a study published by our group showing that um, the uh, unsuccessful coronary cannulation after TAVI was reported in 7.7% of patients. But more importantly, we were able to identify several risk factors for uh, this important uh, endpoint. And among them, uh, among all, the uh, oversizing of uh, uh, the sinus of Valsalva compared with the prosthesis we implanted, the size of the prosthesis we implanted, the depth of implantation that the user evolute valve were associated with an increased risk of uh, coronary uh, cannulation and success. But um, uh, more importantly, going to the focus of PCI after TAVI, this is a study by Stefanini published in Jack Intervention this year is a retrospective multicenter study, uh, including 133 patients uh, out of uh, more than 5,000 patients at a medium time of 191 days uh, with a cumulative incidence of 0.9%. And we see here that PCI indication were equally, almost equally distributed between uh, uh, chron chronic coronary syndrome and uh, acute coronary syndrome, being non stemi the more, the more important and more representative one. We saw that the PCI success was achieved in 96% of patients with no significant difference between the balloon expandable valve and sex, and sex expanding valve. So just a numerical difference, but it was not significant. And on the graph here on the right side on the screen, hand side of the screen, we see that uh, all the, uh, chronic, uh, the, the, the chronic events were concentrated in the first 12 months after TAVI. So this is another important piece of evidence in this topic. Thank you very much, Shamarka. That's very clear. Just one quick question. You, you, in the STEMI patients, you showed a fourfold higher failure rate. Was that due to access in patients who had previous TAVI? Yeah, this was actually in, uh, in terms of reaccess. The, there was a very few patients in which it was not able to, uh, the access was obtained, but was not able to uh, implant the stent, so to perform the PCI, but most of them were because there were some issues in your coronary access. Right, so access is an important issue. Thank you. Okay, so having, having seen this bounce of evidence, uh, I would like to ask uh, Nicholas regarding um, the, uh, the PCI after TAVI. So what your experience, do you have for us uh, some tips and tricks to try to um, optimize our results in case of PCI after TAVI? Yeah, thanks, Marco. As um, as we saw during your your slides and your presentation, uh, reaccess can be a technical issue, and uh, uh, mainly with a, a long frame a transcatheter head valve. Um, and I, I would probably summarize the the technical uh, technical um, advices uh, in the in this slide. Um, of course, you have to know a little bit of uh, the core valve design. It, it seems obvious for TAVI implanters, but 
some PCI after TAVI are performed by operators that are not familiar with TAVI implantation. So we just have to understand that the leaflets are mounted in a supranular fashion, uh, that there is an inflow pericardial skirt that can, that, that can uh, be uh, inside the Valsalva sinus. And by just doing an angio root shot, uh, sometimes it's useful to understand how it was implanted in the aortic root. Was it high, was it low? Uh, you have a first understanding of the coronary takeoff. After that, my advice, most of the time, even for diagnostic angiogram, is to use guiding catheter because the, you have a quality of injection that is better, especially if you're non-selective. You can work with a wire inside that helps you to position. So I think it's useful, uh, useful uh, advice. And most of the time, you downsize your shape of uh, the catheter you would use by 0.5 because the, the route in which you work with this frame is a smaller. So you don't have to, you know that you don't need to have this kind of long shape uh, guiding catheter. And I think maybe uh, regarding PCI, the most important uh, advice I would give is this one, is don't lose time and energy to try to engage selectively your the coronary ostia if it's not easily feasible. You can just position your guiding catheter in front of the ostia. And if you're not selective and you have to do a PCI, you advance your wire uh, in, the, in the coronary artery. And then on your wire, you will advance uh, a guiding catheter extension and will have all the support and all what is necessary to perform your PCI, even if it's complex. But I think it's worth considering that and this issue of uh, difficulties to reaccess also reflect on how to prevent those difficulty. And you probably, you all know that uh, the idea of aligning the commissures of a transcatheter head valve has been developed uh, in order to try to avoid to have the posts of the uh, transcatheter head valve in front of the coronary arteries. And it's perfectly illustrated by the two diagrams you have on your, on your screen. On the left, a good orientation, on the right, uh, a bad commissural alignment, uh, making some difficulties to reaccess the coronary arteries. So for the Evolute frame, we know that we can have an anticipated good proper commissural alignment uh, by just at the time of the introduction, uh, putting the delivery catheter in the position you have at the left of, of this slide with a flush port at three o'clock. And it's something that it's possible also to validate one inside the Arctic roots. Looking at the right of this slide, you see that you have a heart marker at the distal tip of the evolute frame. When you work in LAO or Freca's view, if you have this heart marker at the outer curve, you will probably have a good commissural alignment. If you work in cusp overlap view, it will have to be in the center front. And once the valve will be released, look at the left now of this slide, you will have a C tab at the outflow portion of the frame that will be located at the inner curve in LAO, ensuring that you will have a proper commissural alignment. So thank you very much, Marco and Nicholas. Uh, we've had an interesting discussion about the role of pre-TAVI PCI. Uh, the fact that post-TAVI PCI, we do see acute coronary syndrome of just under 5%. Thankfully, STEMI is very uncommon at 0.3%, but access issues are important. And Nicholas very elegantly summarized tips and tricks for post-TAVI uh, PCI, and importantly, the importance of commissural alignment, which is actually very easy with the Evolute valve uh, by just making the flush port at uh, three o'clock. So thank you very much, Marco and Nicholas, and thank you very much, uh, EuroPCR, for this invitation. <laughs>